a kind of non-moral type of physical variation. Interestingly, all of the people that I've spoken to as part of my own interviews who expressed an opinion about terminology, which not all of them did, but all who did were very critical of the term DSD um, and weren't keen on it at all. <laughs> so DSD might indeed sound less sexual in some way than intersex, but Colligan argues that the medically asexualized model itself shrouds intersex in secrecy and taboo. It makes the sexuality of intersex people literally unspeakable. Even if this stems from a good motivation not to characterise intersex people as inherently more sexual than others, the result, Colligan suspects, is a reinforcing of a social norm in which only people who have normative bodies, that is, able bodies, non-intersex bodies, are allowed sexual gratification and are allowed participation in sexual relationships. In theological terms, the sex of intersex people has also seemingly often been rendered unspeakable. It's almost never discussed theologically, and when it is, it's usually characterised as problematic in some way. Sometimes this occurs because of associations between intersex and homosexuality or gender identity problems, which are also almost universally figured as pathological in theological terms. There are some Christian denominations, perhaps a majority, which haven't really formally recognised that intersex even exists, even happens. Those who do recognise its existence, like my own denomination, the Church of England, nonetheless don't usually recognise its full implications or give it due consideration, I think, in its own right. For example, the way that the Church of England describes intersex in its 2003 document, Some Issues in Human Sexuality, a document some of you may know, uh, fondly or otherwise, is as a kind of foil to transgender. Um, intersex is almost, I think, being used here to prove in some way that transgender is just a psychological thing and not something real, whereas intersex is real in that it happens in bodies, but we don't know what to do with that, really. But I think the specificities of intersex, including the ethical problems raised by the early corrective surgery paradigm, and the Church of England's affirmation of orders of creation grounded in maleness and femaleness aren't discussed in this context. And I think this is ironic because the so-called givenness of biology is appealed to both by the Church of England and by the Evangelical Alliance, whose work on transgender the Church of England draws on, as something divinely ordained, and therefore in some sense immutable. The logical outworking of this argument in their account is that transgender <coughs> people should therefore not seek to change their bodies because their bodies are as God has made them. But corrective surgery for intersex is not problematized in the same way because intersex people's sex is understood as somehow unreal or in need of clarification. And medical intervention is, is figured as appropriate in a way that medical intervention for trans people isn't. So the Christian denominations which will not acknowledge or properly discuss intersex as a phenomenon or engage with the experiences of intersex people, I believe fail to learn about the specificities of what it means sexually, spiritually, socially and so on to have a body which is not clearly male or female. And this seems to occur because so much is invested in the concept of humans being created by God with two distinct and discrete sexes. People who don't fit must be made to fit to make them functional members of society and church. And importantly, this isn't always explicitly expressed, but I think it's there as an implicit narrative. I think this is bubbling away, not very deep under the surface. Colligan su suspects that the asexualization of both disabled people and intersex people is a function of their attempted social rehabilitation, the assimilation or restoration into given social norms. Citing the practice of corrective genital surgery for infants and children born with unusual genitalia, which was particularly common between about the mid-60s and the mid-90s, but still persists in some forms, she says, It's clear that intersex babies are being fixed, at least in part, as a form of rehabilitation that facilitates their bodily deployment into society according to heteronormative measures. In keeping with the body's truth, doctors, however, contend that their medical tampering is simply a means of restoring the infants to their naturally gendered state, denying the role that culture plays in enforcing this imperative. In parallel fashion, in the last several centuries, people with disabilities have been subjected to pacification through the medical gazer's fixation on essentialised and internalised bodily truths, and to reform through the disciplined practices of sheltered workshops, 
special education and physical rehabilitation. The benevolence and charity that have been extended to these individuals rests on their willingness through medical treatment, physical retraining and mental acquiescence to strive to achieve normative standards of bodily appearance and physical, linguistic and cognitive use. By means of these institutional practices, the disabled are to be raised up, restored. That's the end of that quite long quotation. Now, Colligan's not a theologian, but I don't think that this quite biblical sounding language that she ends on is insignificant. In common with physical disabilities, intersex conditions might be figured, and sometimes have been figured, as something which will be removed from bodies when they're perfected in the resurrection. And I think those of us who are working within a Christian theological paradigm in particular, that requires us to think quite hard about what we think healing is, what we think a perfect body is, and indeed where our ideas about good and legitimate kinds of embodiment really come from. As Colligan remarks, some people are less easily rehabilitated, that is, less easily written into a particular social narrative than others. However, those whose difference might have been interpreted as recalcitrance or rebellion can be treated in another way. They can be desexualized, they can be rendered childlike and dependent, and incapable of, incapable of participating in autonomous adult sexual behavior. It's easy to be benevolent to people like this. Colligan says their difference can be much more easily framed as lack or a cause for pity. And here we might look at the kinds of arguments of Christians such as Dennis Hollinger and Charles Colson, for example, who describe intersex people as unfortunate, deformed sometimes, but definitely deserving of compassion. But in this case, compassion means surgery to write them back into the male and female fold, to re-include them into the male and female picture. If all healthy people are cisgender people, and heterosexual people, as God intended, according to a particular interpretation of Genesis, then it makes sense that Christian theologians would like to promote clear bodily sexes as well. But if we accept that in fact not all healthy people are cisgender and heterosexual, and indeed that not all cisgender and heterosexual people are healthy, <laughs> and that other kinds of genders and sexualities also potentially reflect God's image, there's no longer the same theological imperative to insist on clear, binary, physical sex as the only legitimate form of embodiment. After all, theological notions about the goodness and healthiness of heterosexuality and cisgender identities are already grounded in the assumption that there are only two physical sexes, but intersex begins to disturb this picture. Some intersex surgeries those of you who've done some reading in this area will be familiar with this, but I wanted to share some of this perhaps for some of those of you who aren't so much. Some intersex surgeries literally remove sex, they remove genital body parts, slicing through clitorises which are understood as too big or penises which are understood as too small, in order to create a, a kind of version of a perfect clitoris or a perfect penis, whatever that means. But in doing so, however, these surgeries have often directly impacted on the sexualities of those concerned. I want to share with you a few quotations, not from my own interviews, which I'll come to a little bit later on, but, um, but from other literature, or people talking about their experiences of having undergone genital surgery because of their intersex conditions. The first is a woman called Lisa Todd, who underwent surgery on her clitoris. She says, I have a very, very small amount of clitoral sensation. It's not completely dead, but it doesn't do anything for me. God help me if I should ever find the urologist who did this to me. I would call him a butcher. The second quotation is, um, it's quite an old one. It's from 1996. Um, and what was happening around 1996 was that it was the very early days of the intersex activism movement. Um, and some of the early intersex activists did things like um, picketing medical conferences, for example, in order to try to get doctors who performed these surgeries to, to talk to them and to say, we're not so keen on, on what you're doing, let's talk about whether this is a good idea or not. Um, and one of the things that was happening around that time was that there were people who were saying, well, hermaphrodite has been used as quite an abusive term, but let's reclaim it, you know, let's use that and be proud. Um, and one of the early things that the Intersex Society of North America did was to produce a newsletter called Hermaphrodites with Attitude. Um, <laughs> and so this quotation uses the term hermaphrodite, which I think probably wouldn't be used if, if this person was talking now. This is a woman called Angela Moreno. 
She says, it's very painful for me to conceptualize that what has been taken is a very specific eroticism, a hermaphroditic eroticism. That must really scare people and cause a great deal of anxiety. That special part, our sacred sexuality, has been ripped from us. That very special form of sexuality, arousal, and all of that that was uniquely hermaphroditic was taken. That is the crime. And this final quotation is from uh, Ian Morland, who's done a lot of writing um, in cultural criticism. He's based in Britain as well. And he's talking about what he understands as the, uh, the effects on some intersex people's sexuality from the fact that they are no longer able to feel uh, physical sensation in their genital area because of the surgery that's taken place. He says the apparently real time of sexual experience turns into the contemplative voyeurism of pornography. Touching happens, but is seen rather than sensed. I know from direct personal experience that this is profoundly disorienting. When genitalia are insensate, the time of the touch stretches infinitely away from the moment of physical contact. Perhaps one can recall how it felt to be touched prior to genital surgery, or imagine how it might feel if sensation were to return in the future to one's genitalia. Either way, touching and feeling are riven, too late or too early to coincide. And other intersex people have talked about these kinds of experiences of their sexualities being somehow dislocated from their bodies. And this is corroborated by studies which examine, for example, the effects of clitoral and vaginal surgery on intersex people in their capacity to experience pleasurable genital sensation or orgasm and to participate in physically enjoyable sexual activity. According to some critics, in discourses which insist that corrective surgery for unusual intersex genitalia is necessary, the main point of genitals becomes their appearance rather than their sensation. They exist to signify something else, perhaps a good cosmic penis or a decent <laughs> clitoris or the appearance at least of being able to participate in penetrative sex rather than simply signifying themselves as they are. Often, genitals which have been created in this way surgically have, these critics argue, been created for someone else's fulfilment, a surgeon's fulfilment, perhaps to pacify concerned parents or a real or a projected sexual partner rather than that of the individual. And so the genitals become an object of another's pleasure rather than a source of pleasure in themselves. But social norms about what constitutes a good or a normal or a legitimate body are clearly not the only ones in play here. As we've already begun to see, both intersex people and people with disabilities are also influenced and affected by specifically theological pronouncements, both about the nature of a good and healthy body and gender identity, and about what constitutes real or cosmically significant sexual activity in the first place, in particular when cosmically significant sexual activity is characterised, as in Roman Catholic canon law, as necessarily involving penetration of a penis by a vagina, followed by male ejaculation. Nothing else has any significance at all. So theological accounts of the relationships between sexuality and personhood, which focus too exclusively on only certain kinds of sexual activity as carrying cosmic or moral significance, risk perpetuating, I think, the idea that disabled people and intersex people alike are not really capable of being sexual in a legitimate way, or being agents or arbiters of their own sexual and bodily lives. Heteronormative theologies, those focus too much on genital sex and ideally procreative sex as cosmically significant, imply that people who are unwilling or unable to participate in heterosexually partnered vaginal intercourse are not legitimately sexual at all. Even medically, there may be concerns that uncorrected intersex genitalia may lead to homosexuality. Katrina Carcasis is a scholar who's conducted extensive empirical interviews with intersex people, also with surgeons who both do and don't conduct corrective surgery for intersex, and also the families and parents of intersex children. And she says this, the concern is a dual one, that the penis enable penile vaginal intercourse but also that a too small penis may result in gender atypical desires. With an inadequate penis, the fear is not simply that these individuals will not identify as men, but that they will not act like men. Another fairly widespread concern among parents and clinicians is that a large clitoris will lead to a more masculinized sexuality, or to sexual desire for females. 
Surgery aimed at giving the child more gender-typical genitals will therefore provide her with an appropriate sexual preference, i.e. a preference for males if the child is a girl. And in theological terms, I think genitals become a cipher for even more than they do in social terms. They become a cipher for healthily embodied personhood along specifically gendered lines, for the capacity to reproduce social and religious norms, as well as human children. Some of the most disturbing narratives to have come out of the intersex activism movement in the last 15 years or so are those which have focused on intersex people's lack of power over decisions made about their bodies. And these have sometimes made clear that sexes and sexualities which appeared to transgress legitimate norms were forcibly altered. As Colligan notes, the freak show portrayal of hermaphrodites as excessively or necessarily sexual was troublesome. But if its alternative is the ongoing asexualization and infantilization of people who aren't accorded the capacity to make decisions about their own bodies, their own lives and their own sexual activity, this obviously raises problems of its own. Concerns about agency recur in Emily Graben's work on intersex and time, in which she notes that one aspect of the problematic nature of cosmetic intersex surgeries might be that they interfere with the process of actualization. So the individuals concerned, she suggests, might have sought to live their identities forwards, in a forward direction, but their doctors might be drawing on narratives of repair and rehabilitation in order to justify surgery, thus appealing to a kind of mythical past time and mythical perfect genitals that never actually existed. We could note that doctors, for example, have sometimes described making intersex genitals look more natural um, or more as they should have been. And similar rhetoric seems to be at work when theologians insist that a primal, unambiguous mythic maleness and femaleness must serve as the model for all bodies here and now. Abby Wilkerson, who argues from the perspective of social discourses of disability, has suggested that if intersex conditions begin to be figured as sexual disabilities, as increasingly is happening in legal contexts, for the pragmatic reason that although intersex people don't currently have explicit protection under US law, the recent expansion of the Americans with Disabilities Act may provide a means by which intersex people could access increased services and protection, then like other disabilities, she says, they are in part socially constructed. They have to be understood as social phenomena. Resistance to the exclusion and marginal marginalization of intersex people will be social too. But as she notes, and as I'm sure is bubbling away in your minds already, there might be some disadvantages to intersex people coming to be considered disabled under the ADA. These include, for example, the solidifying of the link between intersex and abnormality of some kind, the transferring of stereotypes about people with disabilities onto intersex people, mutual suspicion sometimes between intersex groups and disability groups, with intersex people perhaps resentful of needing to use the ADA in order to get legal protection, and people with disabilities perhaps resentful of intersex intrusion into disability protections, and perhaps a reinforcing of the account of intersex as a medical disorder, which as we've seen some people aren't so keen on. It's important to say that there may indeed, and there may continue to be, specific side effects of having variant intersex anatomy that means some people with intersex conditions indeed can't do some of the same things that non-intersex people do. So two of the biggest examples would be reproductive capacity and perhaps the ability to engage in certain kinds of sexual intercourse. In the first instance, intersex people might have physical specificities, which mean that conception via sexual intercourse will be difficult or impossible for them. An intersex person might, for example, have a penis which is too small to penetrate a vagina, or they may not have testes capable of producing sperm, or there may be a kind of mismatch between the external genital anatomy and the internal anatomy. But many intersex people understand their variant anatomy as precisely that, variant, not pathological, not disordered. And this is one of the major reasons why some intersex support groups are deeply opposed to this move towards using DSD, disorder of sex development. So the second area I'd like to think about a little bit more briefly is the area of prenatal testing. So this is another area of overlap which impacts on both impaired and intersex bodies. And this is the question of the extent to which it's legitimate to try and diagnose particular conditions prior to birth, 
And if they are diagnosed, what's the ethically appropriate thing to do with that information? As most of you will know, in recent decades, pregnant women have increasingly been offered a variety of tests in order to determine whether the fetus they're carrying is at risk of being affected by a range of abnormalities, <coughs> like <coughs> fold screening, amniocentesis, um, this kind of thing. And in fact, certain intersex conditions are now among those for which it's possible to screen prenatally. In some cases, this is just a matter of identifying possible issues, which may or may not then be used as grounds for termination of the pregnancy. But in other cases, it's actually possible to treat the fetus prenatally in order to prevent a condition from developing. In recent years, there's been particular discussion surrounding the use of a steroid called dexamethasone, also called DXT or DEX sometimes, in cases where it's suspected that the fetus may develop congenital adrenal hyperplasia, a specific intersex condition. And if it's suspected that a pregnant woman might be carrying a fetus with that condition, she might be offered DEX treatment, which would prevent female fetuses with that condition from developing unusual looking genitalia. But this is controversial for lots of reasons. I'm just going to touch on some of them briefly. The first reason is that actually the unusual genital appearance associated with the CAH isn't itself detrimental to health. There might be other things associated with that condition which are detrimental to health, but this therapy is specifically designed to stop the unusual de genital development. Um, normally, the, the main genital side effect of that condition is a clitoris which is larger than average, and that doesn't really impact on health directly. Second, in order to be effective at preventing this unusual genital development, the treatment with DEX has to begin several weeks before it's possible to tell whether the child actually has this condition or not. And actually, several weeks before it's even known whether the fetus is male or female. Um, and it, one scholar has suggested that actually only one in eight fetuses who are at risk of this condition will benefit from prenatal DEX treatment, um, which means actually the majority of fetuses would experience unnecessary um, medication. In about half the cases, she argues, where the drug's use is beneficial, children would still be considered to be in need of genital surgery after birth anyway. Another reason is that both the use of this steroid and the actual diagnostic testing itself for the condition can create undesirable side effects for the woman and the fetus, including miscarriage. And finally, earlier this year, a group of researchers claimed that many women who'd been prescribed DEX during their pregnancies were not told that its use in the prenatal treatment of this condition was experimental and off-label. In other words, it hadn't been specifically approved for this purpose by the FDA. And they'd been given the misleading impression that actually DEX had been the subject of long-term <coughs> trials to assess its safety, which wasn't the case. But if we draw all of these things together, the argument that giving DEX prevents children with CAH needing to have genital surgery, a group of scholars have said, actually, we can't really say that that justifies the risk of these other side effects. They say that the reason why DEX has been promoted is that unusual genital development has been represented as undesirable, and feminizing genital surgery as a result has been figured as undesirable. But they've said this risky elective therapy is also undesirable as well, and their argument is that the possible risks attached outweigh the possible benefits. But this is all taking place within a broader cultural narrative. Discussing prenatal tests and postnatal therapy for intersex, Morgan Holmes says this, their shared weakness is the twin assumption that our children are ours to make of what we will, and that we ought to will what is least complicated. In some cases, this means parents striving to prevent their children growing up with physical conditions which may lead to bullying or other psychological problems. But in others, to suggest some researchers, there might be a broader agenda at work. A group of scholars who wrote this year have argued that one of the um, endocrinologists who's been most at the forefront of um, promoting the use of DEX for pregnant women suspected of carrying fetuses with CAH they argue that this doctor has said one of the reasons for giving DEX is so that girls affected are more likely to grow up to have maternal instincts and a heterosexual orientation and to be less tomboyish. And they quote this doctor talking to a group of parents in 2010 about a girl who did have ambiguous genitalia as a result of this condition. This is the quotation from this doctor. The challenge here is to see what could be done to restore this baby to the normal female appearance which would be compatible with her parents presenting her as a girl, with her eventually becoming somebody's wife, and having normal sexual development and becoming a mother. 
and she has all the machinery for motherhood, and therefore nothing should stop that, if girl. we can repair her surgically and help her psychologically to continue to grow and develop as a girl. Now, plenty of scholars have critiqued this kind of approach and have said, well, it's not that parents' needs and desires are unimportant, obviously they're not, but actually, whose goods and whose needs should take precedence? Shouldn't we be most concerned about the needs of the individual, of the child concerned? Um, and again, the same group of doctors have drawn together some research which says really that often this surgery seems to take place because of parental anxiety and in order to allay parental anxiety. They say in that construct, one must question the ethics of using the fetus as a reagent to treat the parent, especially when the risks are non-trivial. Some intersex activists, and those of you who know this literature will be aware of this, have been particularly vocal in their insistence that unusual genitals don't in themselves compromise quality of life or lead to psychological trauma. And in fact, many intersex people have said it's the medical intervention which has caused them more problems than the condition itself. And indeed, there are good grounds for suggesting it's cultural narratives that can be changed. Perhaps it's at least as important to change those cultural narratives as it is to change, or in some cases prevent the births of, the bodies of people who don't fit in. There are two scholars, Elizabeth Rees and Suzanne Kessler, who assert physicians should not sell themselves short in imagining that they cannot, with their words, as much as with their knives and drugs, influence parents to accept their children's bodies and the possibility that their children could lead rewarding lives with those bodies. <coughs> Christian theologians and other Christians too may contribute to a climate in which differences of embodiment are celebrated and accommodated rather than pathologised. But while many Christians have been outspoken in their beliefs that prenatal testing may lead to increased marginalisation of people born with physical impairments, or that terminations should not take place because of fetal impairment, Christian critique of prenatal and postnatal interventions in the specific case of intersex doesn't tend to have occurred in the same way. And this may arise, I think, from particular Christian investment in the creation of distinct and discrete maleness and femaleness as constitutive of a divinely ordained structure by which human society is to operate. Intersex bodies of babies and young children are especially figured as a problem for parents of such children. Katrina Carcasis quotes an anonymous paediatric urologist describing why he believes parents of children with large clitorises would want to have them corrected. Have you seen a baby with CAH? It's grotesque. You're the mother of a newborn with enlarged clitoris and fused labia. Are you going to change the diaper every time? Are you going to hire somebody? Who's going to be the caretaker? Are you going to let any neighbour change that child? Absolutely, positively not. You're tied to that child every minute of every day, of every week, of every month. Now, it would be really easy to say, actually, all parents need is education and then everything will be fine. And I think that's a really attractive position in some ways and I think a very naive position <coughs> in other ways. I think what we need to think about here is weighing up those needs and weighing up those goods. Actually, parents have needs, but parents aren't acting out of sinister motives. Parents are, are acting out of love for their children and wanting what's best for their children when they make decisions about their medical care in all areas, but perhaps particularly in the area of intersex. Parents are well aware that their children are going to have to navigate life in a society which might be less than welcoming towards people with an actual or a perceived difference of physical sex or gender or sexuality. And it's here that questions of eschatology, I think, have to come to the fore. How might theologians and ministers, educators and people of faith live out theologies which are grounded in a belief that there's an inaugurated eschatology, whilst acknowledging at the same time that there might still be ways in which intersex people's bodies might be understood as problematic and as sources of distress, sadness or frustration for them. Martin Hugo Cordova-Quero, who some of you know, says this, if it's true that Christianity plays a role in the construction of normativities that do not allow people, such as transgender and intersex people, to be themselves and to be accepted within churches as such, then the liberating step is to confront those normativities, their discourse and their colonial activities. As the Christian Bible reads, in Christ God was reconciling the whole world, which implies that the Incarnation is not only the starting point where God and the creation join through Jesus Christ, but also an entry point to the possibility to argue in favour of transgender and intersex people within the Christian faith. 
And so for people who believe in the possibility of eschatology and an in inaugurated eschatology, life grounded in the new and coming order is a life rooted in 